Craig Dalton. Um, I'm uh, with HMRI, New England Health, University of Newcastle, and coordinator of flu tracking. So um, thanks for coming to the seminar this afternoon. This is a satellite seminar of the third international workshop on participatory surveillance, or IWOPS 3. And uh, this is the uh, third one in Newcastle. The first one was in Amsterdam, San Francisco, then Amsterdam, and then Newcastle. <coughs> So this is a group of people who do innovative surveillance, usually using online technology. We've had about 50 people from all around the world working together quite hard over the last uh, three days, reviewing our technology, our methods, uh, our epidemiology, our biostatistics, and learning a lot from each other. But we thought it was really useful to come and do a, a public seminar and focus on issues that enable innovations in technology. And so I'm just going to do a brief uh, review of the bios of the folks we've got here. First of all, we've got Mark Smolinski. Now, I met Mark. Uh, he's from Skull Global Threats. Um, uh, Skull Global Threats takes on some of the biggest problems in the world, like climate change, ending pandemics, Middle East peace. Uh, I can tell you more, but that's enough as far as I can <laughs> imagine dealing with. But uh, so I met Mark. We worked on a antivirus outbreak in the southwest of the US in, in the 90s. I was in Colorado. He was in. Arizona, and we're on these teleconferences as we're investigating this uh, really nasty outbreak that was uh, killing a lot of Native Americans, Navajo and Hopi, and a uh, very nasty outbreak. And it's a great introduction to outbreak investigation, and probably suited both our interests in this area to a great degree. So, Mark, hopefully you have a copy of the bios, but Mark is the Chief Medical Officer and Director of Global Health Threats at the Skull Global Threats Fund. And uh, he basically focused on digital disease detection, supporting others to uh, use, new, use technology, new methods to uh, do online surveillance. Um, Mark was also at Google, was on Google Flu Trends, and he invited us over there in 2010 to look at what they were doing and share what we were doing flu tracking and learn how Google Flu Trends worked. And we learned a lot uh, from the young, uh, really enthusiastic engineers at Google, whether they user testing, experience testing, and it was quite a fascinating experience. And they have about 33 different flavors of bar smoothie in the Google cafeteria. <laughs> and uh, in the machines and scooters. Okay. So read more about, about um, uh, I'll move on to Jennifer Olson. She's manager of pandemics at Skull Global Threats. So Jennifer has a PhD in digital disease uh, detection. And she's got a bachelor's degree in biomathematics, so she's very methodological. She's had a wide range of experiences in um, working in large public health incidents and dealing with data fusion, which she might say more about. She um, also facilitates hackathons, epi hackathons, so we might hear a bit more about that as well. Moving to Chiro Couture, who's director of ISI, Italy. So this is a, I get to say more about the institute, but it's been fascinating over the last three days. Um, Chiro chipped us all. He actually chipped us. We were chipped for two, three days, walking around, interacting with each other, and he was creating these network maps of everywhere we went, uh, who we were face to face with, and that helps us to really understand how disease spreads. Because they used to fill in diaries saying, where, who have you been face to face with? You know, where'd you go? And people didn't do that very well. But now there's technology. You can really track in real time what people are doing. We had a network map showing where people were moving and who they were talking to. And uh, who's saying at one conference in Greece, they had all this network data and they put up a list of uh, best buddies. And they thought that probably wasn't such a good idea because maybe some of the best buddies weren't known before that. <laughs> Which, again, we had a lot to talk about during the last three days on privacy issues and big data. So, so um, we'll show some of the work that, uh, and discuss some of the work that Chiro has done. Lastly, we have Ken Susampo. So Ken is a, uh, a young entrepreneur, a social entrepreneur from Thailand. And uh, Ken is co-founder of Open Dream. And they leverage pretty low cost technology in, in Thailand to develop really innovative surveillance systems. We'll talk a bit more about that uh, soon. And uh, he's you know, he's a computer engineer. And again and again, we're seeing uh, interesting people working in public health that aren't the typical MPH doctor or nurse. So Ken's a computer engineer, G 
Shiro is a, has a, a degree in theoretical physics. Okay, so it's quite a broad spectrum. So the way things will work today is we're, um, we're streaming on YouTube live, so uh, hopefully there'll be some people watching there. But at the end of uh, a brief um, some interviewing of these folks, we're going to turn it over to questions. Okay. So I might start, just a few slides. So Skull Global Threats runs flu near you, very similar to flu tracking. Um, it's, it tracks influenza related illness right across the US. They have some wonderful maps. And it's we do it, they do it, so we get an idea of where flu is spreading, how severe it is, how the clusters, and get another really interesting insight at the community level of flu, flu activity. During the pandemic, with these sort of insights that showed us that while the hospitals were overflowing, the ICUs were full, the actual attack rates in the community were not that bad. We looked at the lab data, we looked at the, uh, the emergency data, emergency room data, it looked terrible because people were rushing in really worried. But the actual levels in the community were not that bad. And these sort of systems that are able to show that. Um, Jennifer facilitates EpiHack, and I'll get her to talk a little bit about that soon. That runs in many different countries around the world, and a great benefit for those countries. This is a slide from some of Chiro's work. Uh, he produces these wonderful graphics, which uh, can uh, really tell us a lot about what's going on in the world. And then uh, Ken's work. Uh, anyone read Type? <laughs> you can translate. Uh, you know, uh, the mobile phone is doing such wonderful things in countries that were considered to have communication problems previously, are really being opened up through uh, mobile phone technology. So, I'll stop there. And I might just ask some questions of you, if that's OK. So I ask all of you just to, if you can say something about your organisation in terms of, we're trying to focus on not just the deep dive into technology here, but for a group of public health researchers, practitioners, who might want to be innovative in their work and bring you things rapidly to have an impact in public health. From that perspective, what's special about your organisation? or What allows them or enables your organisation to innovate? Great, well, I can start with that. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for letting us come and spend some time with you. Um, I think, you know, it starts with the leadership at the top. Our foundation was started by Jeff Skoll, uh, who was the uh, founder of eBay. Uh, and so Jeff, uh, after he made uh, his money uh, after selling eBay, um, really wanted to put all of it into philanthropic work. And for him, having obviously been an entrepreneur himself, having another foundation, uh, you saw the logo up there for the Skoll Foundation, which is our sister organization. Jeff actually has two philanthropies. Uh, they support social entrepreneurs around the world. So when he created us, we had the advantage of somebody who really understood innovation, understood investing in good people, doing good things, and basically just gave us the mandate of five uh, global threats. Uh, the pandemics, climate change, nuclear weapons, uh, the Middle East conflict, and uh, water scarcity. So uh, we had a clean open slate uh, in basically creating this new foundation to bring new thinking and innovation to tackle these ideas in ways that uh, really we had no constraints at all uh, on what was possible other than you know, we do have a budget. Uh, but it really is a great opportunity and, and it, it comes from who's leading your organization. So we're, we're really blessed to have somebody who wants to impact on these issues and understands we're in a unique position because we sit in Silicon Valley. We have access to all the latest technology. We see how it's literally changing businesses and academic institutions and other uh, organizations in ways that the public health community, we just don't think is capitalizing on using that same kind of technology. And in a lot of places, it's because it's just not known. Uh, so our board, uh, when we have meetings, really likes to emphasize the fact that, wow, we're not creating new technology. We're really just moving technology to other parts of the world. Well, like, yes, I mean, that's what's really great about it. Because what we do for our foundation 
is very cost effective in the grand scheme of things because we're taking pre-existing technology that's being used in other sectors and trying to build capacity around the world. And we work mainly in developing countries uh, where the public health systems are so poor that if we can take a paper-based system that takes months uh, to report up to where outbreaks are missed because none of that data is looked at in real time, and simply bring technology to help countries build real-time disease surveillance systems, we are seeing that impact immediately. And so I think it really has to do with the leadership in the organization, and uh, we have that advantage, as well as we sit in an area where we see technology every day, and so we feel the need to try to move that around. So since Jen's at the same organization, I'll let her. <laughs> Um, I guess there's also an element of being philanthropy, that we are able to be um, innovative in our approach uh, and kind of uh, put ourselves in a role where we're trying to help ministries or other groups in their, in their challenge, whatever that may require. Um, so that allows us to constantly be thinking of new and different ways uh, of what we do. Um, as well as being in an organization that is not uh, disease Centric, right? Often in public health, you have uh, programs uh, that are disease based, and uh, we're kind of looking at a systematic level. I say we're disease agnostic in that regard. Um, and so that, that just provides a bit more openness in the way we think about our work. Hello, Dr. Um, at Sci Foundation, it's also a sort of an unusual institution. We are based in Italy, and um, you know, it's a very traditional place up in Italy too much, you might say, I think so. Um, and, and I assign that landscape is, uh, is a fundamental research uh, privately funded institution. So the, the idea uh, by design, and it starts with leadership again, and we were founded by Mario Rassetti, a leading physicist who led a, a quantum information revolution 35 years ago. Um, and the idea was to create something lean that could move faster at the interface of new disciplines where there are interesting questions that can be addressed by brokering knowledge from different domains and cross contaminating cross coordinating um, science. Um, started out as a bunch of physicists, but now we are a mix of physicists, computer scientists, designers, uh, sociologists, uh, epidemiologists, and vets recently. Um, so it's uh, the, 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 the key was really to maintain some, a place with a very high turnover young place, I'm unfortunately the older person, <laughs> um, that, that really moves faster at the intersection these days of data and health. Um, the, the values of the institution are really very strongly communicated uh, to the culture of the place, and it's really about free, free uh, research. The, the ability to, to have a very flat uh, organization uh, where there are very few uh, boss heads, um, and where people, you know, if you ask a researcher at ISI, like, who, who do you report to? Most people don't have a clue about that. <laughs> and, and we find that that is great. I mean, people sort of assemble themselves into, into things uh, that, are, that tackle problems. Um, and that's the culture of the place. So, um, and that's what we try to do somehow in, in forward. Uh, and then there is an obligation to sharing. Um, this is culturally very, very present. Uh, to sharing in the academic sense, but to publish. Uh, the best papers you can, uh, but also to, to, to share in terms of communicating to the general public uh, that the world is changing, and to also uh, try to make impact, try to work uh, on deeply theoretical problems sometimes, uh, but also keeping in the foreground that uh, there is an obligation to, to have social impact. Um, and, uh, and in this moment, uh, data and data are really at, at a flash point, and we are really happy to do that. Everybody say I want to say already. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I would say like I'm in kind of uh, from Thailand, right? And, and China, Thailand is uh, anybody ever been to Thailand? No. Yeah, yeah. nice country, right? <laughs> but people are a little bit interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I would say that Thailand is a country that we are a developing ish country. So, uh, so, so we, we are a little bit like conservative and in terms of technology, especially in my field, I, I 
being trained as an engineer, computer engineer. So that I think that's forced me to be innovate. I mean, in terms of personal um, persuasion, because like I need to to fight with the world in developing each country. So um, it's it's it, it's the first force that that push us. Uh, push me as the leader of the company and as the social enterprise to be innovate. And the, the second thing is, I think, by having that kind of force that force you to be innovate, it needs you to think upside down or out of the box or whatever word you, you, you choose. But like, for example, if you are a software company focusing on Social issues again in developing each country, you you would have much of thing to do there because um, like it's only few business opportunity there is only um, it, it's very hard to find like coworkers who want to do this kind of weird thing all together. So um, it's also it's come to yes the leadership. And from my experience, it's about an openness in, in, in the organization. I think if, if we think open dream as the like, normal company, uh, we are not normal company, you know, like, um, but like, if we are a like, traditional IT company in Thailand, we, we probably end up with like, just servicing the other big organizations. Um, but an openness allows us to see things more than what we what we train to be seen. So, for example, like um, we are now focusing on three topics, like three tools that that could solve the problem. Um, we first focus on healthcare, and the second one is education, and the third one is livelihood. And and when we see outside our computer engineering world, like oh, there are um, there there are the problem in healthcare. It, it again force you to, to seek for like the other um, the other friends who you can work with and, and it's very fortunate for us that we met like school foundation I met Mark like several years ago and school foundation as well as like you, you can meet new organization in your own country that that try to seek for you like for somebody like you as well so I think Openness is one of the big contributing factors for us to, to help us to innovate. Oh, nice. Thank you. So, we talked about organizational characteristics that enable innovation, but what about any personal or personality traits that either in yourself you'd like to share or uh, that you notice in others around you that help enable innovation or put those sort of people at the center of innovation? Yeah, so I think um, you can't be afraid to fail. Uh -huh. I mean, that's got to be a personality trait for certain. Uh, I mean, as a public health doc, I certainly never expected to have a chance to spend four years at a company like Google uh, helping them start their foundation. And you know, the one thing that I learned there is you were never allowed to say the word can't. Uh, in any meeting, um, which is really interesting if you think about it, like it sounds really simple, but you find yourself saying that a lot. And when you catch yourself saying that, you have to come up with a solution or a challenge and not able to say that you can't do something really just always makes you think about uh, alternative uh, solutions. So, you know, I think it's really also being very, you know, we talk about openness as an organization, but if you want to innovate, you also have to be open yourself and, and have no ego or uh, pride of uh, ownership because the most important thing about innovating is we say in Silicon Valley, you know, you have to fail fast and fail often. And in fact, uh, if you don't have failures under your belt, you're not considered an innovator in, in, the, in the area. So. Um, it really is just you know being open to others and, and be willing to have your work uh, entirely criticized and 
Know that that's just going to improve it and adapt it. And if you fail, you just figure out why it failed and you move on to something else. And uh, that's what I find, you know, especially even in the group that we gathered here, uh, I think most of the people in the room sort of have that same personality. Uh, I think one of the biggest elements is listening. Um, we often kind of think about that in the sense of listening to ideas, um, but I actually think it's about listening to your leadership if you're in an organization, um, trying to understand what kind of questions they ask and what their focus is. Um, because once you can learn that really well, you can meet those expectations and then have kind of that free mental space to be innovative in, um, in ways that are otherwise not available. Uh, I think that's especially critical. Um, and I think the other is to be passionate. Um, I work for one of, I think, the most passionate public health people I've ever met. Uh, and I think that inspires <laughs> that. Um, and I think that actually inspires crowds. I think you can think about the past few days of this international workshop, and it was the third in a series. Uh, and when I think about probably all the energy of all those people, um, that has to be harnessed, and people have to get excited for innovation to happen. And that often requires that passionate person in the front giving that charge, um, making it happen. <coughs> Um, I guess it's also important to um, push your, I mean, be comfortable with the idea of pushing yourself outside of what you think you are. Uh, as, as we were mentioning, I'm, I was trained as a theoretical physicist, my, my PhD is in the domain, and today I put sensors on people to measure uh, our place. If somebody told me you, you'll end up doing that, I would have laughed. And, um, uh, and, 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 and the thing is that. Uh, and that's why it's important to genuinely interdisciplinary institutions that you need to have an environment that nudges you towards uh, exploring other uh, selves, other other things you, you can do. And and I think it's really important not to be uh, put off by 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 environments, by communities uh, who tell you, well, you cannot do this because you don't have X, Y, Z. You are not trained as a X, Y, Z, and so you cannot do this. Uh, and which doesn't mean that you still don't have to study. I mean, you still have to study all that is relevant to that field, but then, of course, you can open your mouth and try and say something about that. Um, so be, be, being able to be comfortable with this, I think it's, uh, it's important. Uh, and the other thing is, especially when, when it comes to like sensors and big technologies, we really, uh, enjoying that. Like the, the thing that makes me most proud of, you know, on the diagram that you are showing it is that half of the code running inside these devices, I wrote it myself. <laughs> and that's, you know, it's, it's really my code running there. And, uh, and I have a past as a software engineer. I was in San Francisco in a startup that disappeared overnight. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, it's that, that's really part of what uh, allows you to then uh, go explore things. And uh, you will fail most of the times, but sometimes you bring something cool back home. Yeah, again, being the last person to say it's like, everybody <laughs> has a <laughs> thing. <laughs> 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 or you can start. You can start. So I would like to emphasize what Mark said. With, like, what what drives us inside the company is we, of course, everybody afraid of failure, right? But um, I, I and I believe that we in the company believe that fail fast better than fail later. So you can learn fast and and come back very fast. Uh, but 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 the, the the point of coming back is is the other thing that that needs another personality to cope with. Um, so I I maybe something. We would like to, we, we don't like fail, but, but it's okay to fail as long as it comes, uh, as long as we can predict it. So it's like 50% fail, 30% fail, it is fine. So um, it's great if it not fail, it's great if it is not success, but um, we believe that we should find a way to, to come back very fast keep doing what you are doing right now. And for like just maybe it's for my personal personality, um, I'm so afraid 
of being built because like training as an engineer, if you know like kind of software engineering, if you fail, if you create bugs, it's like ruin your life sometimes. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm really afraid of that. But finding like there is no this kind of thing in um, like yin yang, like Chinese thing, right? <laughs> Black and white, find, find a balance who, who think together, who do things together with you, and, and you will see the other perspective of doing things. And so, yeah. doing things alone is fine, but if you could find a balance in your work life, it's really good. I'm just borrowing a watch and technology. <laughs> so Kane, let's let's start with you. <laughs> so what technologies, what innovations do you think are around the corner, just over the horizon, that would be of interest for public health practitioners thinking thinking ahead in ten, five years, whatever you think, but things you know, big data, applications, mobile phone, internet of things, wearables, what do you think is around the corner? If we say, yeah. okay, if, if we're talking about this, um, especially in Thailand, I would say electronic medical records, which happened in possibly for the decades, right? Um, yeah, I think in Thailand, like, I, okay, there, there, are, there are two perspectives. In, in the global perspective, I, I think that there are some applications that that's being used in um, in the commercial company already, for example, like in um, financial industry. There are like kind of like machine suggestion thinking that that help you write the, the analysis, uh, financial analysis. Uh, machine kind of learning. You mean machine learning? I don't know the name, but like that kind of ideas. So I, I think like um, machine intelligence that, that can help you, especially on augmented intelligence for um, public public health decision. That that would be very helpful. I I know I, I like I'm not from public health, so saying this would um, would make some public health people angry because like how can you trust machine? That kind of thing. So, but uh, I, I, I would say um, it, it would be inevitable that like kind of machine intelligence and machine learning that help you see the bigger picture of um, the, class, uh, the, the, the health of the communities by collecting like, various kind of sensors or signal would will, will, will help you see the, the clearer picture of public health. That's global perspective. But for local perspective, especially Thailand, electronic medical records would help a lot on at least um, helping people uh, take care of themselves better. Yeah, because like, if, if you can carry your medical record home and have some kind of um, suggestion, simple suggestion algorithm for, for personal health care, that would like revolutionize Thai health industry. That, that's what I take. I have to say where I'm both. But but actually, it's much more than that. I mean, uh, you you all uh, um, you know about uh, the new wave of wearable devices that track your activity, that um, quantify more and more information about your body and health conditions. I think we see a lot of innovation there. Um, we start seeing uh, uh, companies that develop ingestible sensors that are able to your digestive tract and measure things and relay them to an external uh, device. Uh, we, we have a lot of these devices. There are challenges uh, uh, and, and, and those are the outstanding ones in tapping somehow into your bloodstream, trying, trying to see whether you can check for the presence of a given pathogen uh, or a given condition. Uh, that is uh, only acceptable if you access the, the, the bloodstream. There is ongoing work on using nanotechnology to actually the nanodegrades patches that somehow 
uh, create some kind of contact that allows you to measure things more accurately. Uh, that is probably not around the corner yet. Um, we we'll certainly see the smartphone emerging uh, as an hub for all of these devices, not necessarily on your body, maybe at home with have some, uh, some basic devices capable of doing uh, some, some simple analysis, some simple lab analysis for clinical um, use. So we'll, we, we'll move slowly towards what people call uh, today with little hype, the, the Internet of Things, the idea that uh, all of these devices will be networked, will be talking to each other. Um, and we will face the, the challenge, uh, the, the benefits, but also the problem of, of managing private data clouds, where you have a bunch of wearable devices, uh, your car, uh, your TV, your smartphone, collecting data uh, about, about yourself. Uh, and this is not just the uh, clinical or microbiological or health-related data. This is a lot of uh, behavioral data. Um, a lot of the challenges in health are now related to chronic conditions, which you can control by changing somehow behaviors. So the ability to monitor behaviors and to track their evolution, the ability to nudge behavior. You hear a lot of people uh, speaking about behavior change, behavior nudging. There is a lot of knowledge coming from behavioral economics, uh, organizational sciences that will flow into, into this, uh, both at the individual level, uh, if, for example, you are a health insurer or if you are a, a, an healthcare facility, and at the population level, if you are a health protection um, agency. So I think we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see uh, a lot of data on the leaves of the network, uh, and we'll have to design new ways of brokering this data to higher level where decisions at the population level can be made, striking the balance between the, the huge opportunities that are ahead and the need to protect uh, uh, very, very sensitive and intimate information in many cases. Uh, I think in the next five years we'll see a big change in um, the way that data is uh, collected from people because people are getting more and more invested in citizen science approaches. We talk about this for things like flu near you, but I think uh, when you look at how well people are signing up for uh, health registries around chronic risk factors or cognitive function factors, that's really evolving. Um, and I think you see huge changes in recruitment uh, in even how you position join a study versus be a citizen scientist. Um, and I think that that, if it can be harnessed for public health purpose, will really change uh, that community. You're also starting to see people uh, develop and run their own, essentially, clinical trials based on what conditions they have or queries they have um, on online portals where you say, uh, I want to test if butter is really bad for me. Does anybody else want to get in on this study with me? Um, and you can kind of be part of a cohort of people. And I think that's just changing our scientific knowledge by using that, harnessing it in a different way and, and kind of positioning differently. Yeah, and I think in addition to all the things that were said uh, by the group, you know, we're starting to realize the hidden value in data um, that I think, you know, might not necessarily be, you know, what technologies are coming forward, but it's basically using the ability of the technology that we have to now integrate massive data sets and start to find, you know, really helpful um, signals for various issues. So just to give you an example, um, they did a big retrospective study uh, in Bangkok uh, with the FAO looking at the region, really mainly data between Laos and Cambodia, and whenever they had a bird flu outbreak, this was back in 2006, 2007, they looked retrospectively and there was always a sell-off of chicken really cheap in the markets weeks, sometimes several weeks, before there would be a major outbreak in the area. So now, prospectively, we're starting to collect data from the sell of meats and markets in areas that you know, is something that's already recorded by every market worker and so forth, but the fact that we can now take that simple piece of data and meld it with other data, we're starting to find ways to look at outbreaks before they actually even, you know, materialize into something that a public health system or an animal health disease surveillance system where things are going to catch that we can find those earlier. You can also look at some of the efforts, uh, I, I'm not sure if this is uh, Rochester University who presented this at a meeting, but it, it was a, 
uh, institution on the East Coast, where they had combined publicly available Twitter data, your Facebook data, um, any other thing that they can get on your uh, information, and they created algorithms um, based on your social networks and what was going on with things you were saying that they, with a 90% accuracy, could tell you that you were gonna get the flu seven days before you even had a symptom. <laughs> A little creepy. Uh, you know, we also saw things where people were looking at data, again, all publicly available data on uh, pregnant women, and they could literally predict which women were going to suffer from postpartum depression uh, just by looking at all of this publicly available data. So then you get into a lot of ethical issues as well. So what does that mean? Are you doing anything to help those women or is it just a research project that's really cool that you can find it? So a lot of these things are really being applied in very uh, effective ways, but it's also scary that it's opening up opportunities for lots of interesting research. And as an academician, I realize like people need to publish data and do things, but we're sort of crossing some lines where are we just doing things for the sake of doing it, or are we doing it because we're really trying to help the people whose data you are using without their knowledge to advance your careers and so forth? You know, that might be okay, but we should be also doing it to really protect the people whose signals you're using uh, and figuring out a way um, that we can do that. I mean, I'm reminded back when I was a clinician in the 80s, and you know, there was a lot of debate about testing everybody who came to the emergency room uh, for HIV anonymously as the hospital uh, just to find out what the burden of that was. And you know, the ethics committee, uh, we shot that down because it said if we're testing people for HIV, we need to let them know they have HIV. It's not fair to just do that kind of stuff. And that was, you know, years ago. But I see the same kinds of things happening with publicly available data where, you know, we're almost creating human subjects out there uh, with no informed consent, and the you know uh, community who does this kind of research just assumes because the data is public that it's okay to use. But now when we're combining five or six different data sets and really creating more knowledge, uh, we have to question you know is is that uh, appropriate or how do we involve? So you know we've been really interested in participatory surveillance because we think we ought to be asking people directly and you ought to think they ought to be part of the solution. They should be providing this information because they're getting something valuable back. Uh, and you know, so that's where I think the technology is allowing us to do that, but uh, you know, I, I think the, uh, the use of big data, which is a term I also hate, but uh, is raising lots of challenges uh, in addition to you know, the use of wearable technologies and other things. So, Lots of exciting opportunities, but really a lot of unanswered questions about privacy and ethics that we need to address as a community. And was one of the topics that we talked about in the last three days at our sessions. Yes, I mean, one thing we did talk about with regard to uh, anonymizing data, we think we anonymize data, we can't know who this person is, but you probably, there's all these you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, and network analysis. We don't really think in a network analysis uh, perspective, really. Uh, but Facebook does. So who has had a surprise um, uh, email from Facebook saying, do you know this person? You can't figure out how Facebook knows that. Mm -hmm. Haven't met anybody? People who have left the country to get away from someone uh, <laughs> end up getting suggested that they make friends with them you know, on Facebook. So, Somehow it can figure out these network effects, which aren't obvious perhaps to researchers at all. But when the data gets put together and then some other very clever uh, network analysis person gets that data, they can reveal a lot of things that we might know are actually there. Mark, I'd like to talk a bit about this um, position of public health entrepreneur in residence. Um, the background of this is uh, Skolf had uh, Alexi de Beloy, um, their public health entrepreneur in residence, and I got to have a few Skype calls with him just trading ideas that we both use to market our online surveillance systems. And uh, we both use Facebook and different successes with it. And uh, uh, Alexi was saying, oh, you know, we put a picture, because they split test pictures and see what works best. So putting up a picture, the same message with different pictures, see which gets the highest click through rates, a picture of a local neighborhood 
you know, the houses in the neighbourhood, this locality really touched people and they click on it, it's flew near you, what's going on in my community? So we had lots of interesting conversations and I started looking at other entrepreneurs and residents, the Robert Johnson Foundation has one, uh, and uh, the CDC now, Centers for Disease Control, is an entrepreneur and residence program. My understanding is that it started in uh, finance and venture capital and then it's been picked up in other areas that bring some entrepreneurial person into a role to really stimulate entrepreneurial ideas. But could you say a bit about that role? Yeah, so that was the first time our foundation has brought on an entrepreneur in resident. We did it specifically for the project that we were working on with uh, Harvard University, the flu near you surveillance system, which was built largely by using Craig and his team here who had all the experience in flu tracking to help us even think about how to build that system uh, in the US. So it probably gets back to one of the earlier questions about your personality and what does it take to be an innovator, but also you know you get into all kinds of territories that you really know nothing about. Uh, and that's the situation I think we got into with flu near you. Um, you know, our concept was great, we knew why we wanted to engage the public, but all of a sudden, you know, here we are three three years into a system that we built that literally was generating a signal that was as accurate as the US CDC signal for flu. And all of a sudden we're like, wow, okay, what's our business model? What do we do with this now? Are we gonna just fund this forever as a foundation? Should we turn this into a, uh, some sort of company that can generate, you know, an, uh, as a not-for-profit, but revenue to go back into the system? Because, yeah, I mean, nothing's free. It's, it's a very inexpensive way to do surveillance, but it still costs money to, you know, develop the, the system, to maintain the database, to have your, you know, uh, tech, technicians. But, uh, so we brought out an entrepreneur in residence and sought out somebody who had done multiple startups, who had been part of the business community, uh, with the idea that could we bring him into the foundation for one year uh, and have them solely focus on a product like Flu Near You uh, to help us think through because we have lots of other ideas that we're generating uh, at the foundation that are also, you know, clearly, you know, pure operational uh, efforts where, you know, we've been working with groups to, to create the idea and do that. But it's so unlike typical philanthropy where you get a you know a proposal from somebody and you fund them and they go off and do the work. Well we've sort of twisted out its head and we're trying to figure out, you know, how are we addressing ending pandemics and what it's going to take. And I bet 75% of our whole portfolio are things that we've created ourselves and partnerships uh, with people in the countries where we're trying to help. Uh, and it just leads us now into these dilemmas about, you know, what are sustainable models moving forward. So that was a great experiment for us. Um, we didn't get the answer that we had hoped at the end of the year. We got a lot of great, uh, uh, I would say, added value to all of our work in a foundation that brings someone on. Um, but we probably should have told you, you know, uh, I think until a year ago we were 10 people and now we're 18. That's just the whole foundation addressing all five of those threats. So maybe you all thought we were like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation <laughs> with thousands of people. No, we're 18. Uh, so we need to bring in these other, you know, sort of sectors because, uh, you know, our vision really is to empower and enable people in the countries uh, that we're working on and not to build out a big foundation and a lot of staff. So we're trying to figure out creative ways to bring in people to help us think through this. So all of our efforts are really going into, um, you know, enabling countries uh, to solve their own problems by you know, using developers in their countries and so forth. And maybe this is a good chance to let Jen talk about the method that we use to do that in these epi hacks, uh, because we see that as something that's sustainable and long term and doesn't lead us into the situation that we got ourselves into with Flu Near You. Uh, but instead, you know, we put the onus on the governments where we work great right from the beginning in creating their own tools that you own it and, you know, we'll help you and, you know, we'll fund uh, the, the initial couple of years to bring everything together and do it, but uh, it's, it's a much better model for us because it allows us to keep the vision that we want, to keep the foundation small and really uh, work with others. Um, so yeah, maybe you can talk about that because I think it'll give you a better idea of where we're going. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we would like to hear about the Epi Hacks because we 
I think we'd like to run something like that here at HMRI in the future. We know you guys focus on, uh, on uh, they focus on uh, high-income countries, let's say. Yeah. So, uh, over to you. Sure. So, uh, EpiHacks are just what they sound like, epidemiology hackathons, uh, where we bring together epidemiologists and other public health professionals with developers uh, with a variety of skill sets. And we usually do this um, in partnership from the start with a Ministry of Health or a federal health entity um, who may or may not have an idea of the types of challenges they want to solve. So sometimes these events are very focused, um, set on a type of outbreak, let's say in Laos, the focus was on dengue uh, reporting. Um, we're hosting an event um, coming up in Myanmar though that is uh, much broader. It's moving their current paper-based system to some form of electronic, digital-ish system. So that could go almost anywhere. Um, and what these events are is they're a, a week long, usually, uh, a ratio of about two technologists to one health person, um, and usually under about 50 people. And that's kept small so that the first day people can kind of describe problems and warm up to talking to each other, because as I, I think most people realize, uh, the language of public health is not always the most technology-friendly language, and vice versa. Um, I'm sure Ken can tell you there are many times when I say something to him, he's like, I don't, those words do not equate to a program. I cannot, I cannot code for that. Um, and uh, you know, I think it goes the other way. Um, so there's a necessity to kind of have that bonding happen, to go out sometimes into a field, the field and, and see a site where the challenge is happening. Uh, and then for the technologists to work uh, hour after hour, late into the night, sometimes during this week, to develop prototypes uh, and to kind of engage constantly with the health experts on, is this right, does this work, can you write me the list of symptoms or can you help me with this part while I write this code. Um, and so these events lead to prototypes, sometimes they're very well developed, ready to go, sometimes they're uh, pictures like those ones you see in the photo, uh, or uh, a lot of sticky notes describing an idea, um, and I think they kind of open communities to thinking about who their local development assets are, uh, or developers are. So the invitees are not just people who work in the Ministry of Health in technology, they're people from local companies who have uh, social responsibility hours, or local developer groups uh, who like to do this kind of work, and they're in their time in their time off um, and the key element is at the end you have uh, kind of engaged uh, health professionals and thinking about what the future might be so maybe some of those solutions will be adopted but maybe it will also have opened people's uh, mind as to what else can exist and we'll often end the event with high level officials from the organization uh, who are amazed sometimes when they see what happened in a week uh, as well as see all the technology capability that exists often in, in your backyard, um, just not people you're regularly speaking to. Uh, and so we've had uh, five of these events throughout the world. Uh, we're headed into two more, um, and we're getting really close to having uh, all of the materials about how to do this online. So places like uh, Hunter can do their own event. You know, there's a facilitator guide, an organizer guide, a checklist, who do you need to invite? Um, all available because we do think this model is really powerful um, no matter what kind of resources you have or challenge you have uh, it's more about the approach uh, that would lead to success. Can I just uh, add to that so um, we're really happy to say that you know we started this process of doing the EpiHex I don't know maybe three years ago um, but we have some incredible systems owned by countries that have literally been the outcome now of the EpiHack. So uh, I think the one that we're really thrilled about, because for us, it exemplifies where we'd like to see all of our work go. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the term One Health. Uh, you know, if I go to another One Health conference uh, that just talks about what it is, which is you know human health, animal health, environmental health, and the question is, Who's doing One Health? So the EpiHack that we had in Chiang Mai uh, was focused on One Health, and now there is a PodD project um, 
that you know we hope to replicate countrywide because it's been so successful. It's basically empowering communities to think about you know not only their own health but their animal health and their environmental conditions, and they're reporting all of these things into mobile phones through the community health reporters. And we're finding outbreaks of disease in animals before they even become outbreaks in humans. We're starting to look at food safety issues. We're starting to look at air and, and water quality. So, you know, we're starting to see now where Jen says sometimes the EpiCag is really just creating awareness and the ability for them to go away and think about, wow, it's really possible. And that's why we do it with the local developers. So even when the EpiCag is over, these are developers from their own country that they can keep working with and everybody signs a you know, a waiver that any uh, intellectual property created in EpiHack is open. Nobody owns anything. And so uh, it really gives us a chance to see what's possible. And, you know, the Thailand example is one in, in Cambodia, where we had one of the earliest EpiHacks. You know, I was just out there in, in January. They launched three projects. The government launched three projects that were the results of the EpiHack years earlier, including, you know, uh, a simple hotline where anybody can call anywhere from the country of Cambodia, regardless of who your telecom provider is, for free. Now that sounds really simple, but that was a lot of work in a developing country with many telecom companies and so forth. And the fact that a lot of these innovations are stagnated just because even though it only costs a couple cents uh, to do a phone call, if you're talking about disease reporting every day in real time from every clinic, you know, what we're finding out is telecoms have never even been approached to be part of public health. And when they look at the fraction that is needed for public health surveillance overall in their business, they basically say, we should be doing this for corporate social responsibility. So it opens up those kind of avenues too, where people are now uh, more open to, you know, public health thinking about using innovations and, uh, and it's really exciting to see. So. You know, it's just not a process that we do for a week without any outcomes. Now we're starting to see the fruition and it's motivating us to do more and more of these, but obviously there's no response, so uh, it'll be exciting to see whether this sort of manual or the how to, you know, do your own epi hack uh, can come to fruition because we'd like to see these being done by people on their own because it's, you know, it's not rocket science as they say, but, uh, we hadn't seen it done before. And it's a solution that really, uh, for the local governments, uh, the fact that everything that they created, that they own, that it's open source, and they're from their own local developers, just inspires complete buy-in and momentum that is a lot different than when I first started public health. And I remember people coming to a Ministry of Health and trying to sell them some disease software. Uh, that you know, two years later would be archaic. So I think this is the future when we talk about uh, the future and innovations, and and we're really excited to see this process, and we hope to see more of them come about. Interesting. I was teaching in Bhutan in 2010, went back in 2012 to offer them some software that we used here, and I saw the software they had, and it was clearly superior to what we have uh, in many <laughs> New South Wales health departments because. They could access it on Android phones, tablets, and uh, we couldn't do that. Uh, and it was also very flexible and cheap to change. And you know, it's really interesting to see how sometimes these small entities, resourceful entities, are much more innovative. Uh, so, a good point to end at this idea of the Epi Hack Hackathon. Um, we were sorry that only 50 people could attend uh, the IWOPS in Newcastle. And it really is a hands-on workshop. There's lots of talk, lots of face-to-face -face work. Um, it's completely monitored by Chiro. And um, what we'd like to do is bring some of the learnings into the Hunter and share it. And we're thinking a hackathon could be the way to do it. And I see the Pro Vice, Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor of Electrical Engineering, or Engineering over there, is taking notes. So it may be that we can tap into computer science and engineers to do this using your methodology. We may invite see if some of the skull folks can come back, or some of the other I For sure. Folks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They've been a week uh, at Kanawa. So, <laughs> so look, I think um, we might go to questions now. Um, and if you anything else comes to mind, please be inspired by the questions. But 
And people want to talk about the idea of the hackathon or something like that. I'm interested to hear your views, but let's open up for questions. There's a great amount of data being collected in supermarkets every time anything's sold. Um, so, has anyone heard of a public health application of knowing what's going through every cold and wool in the country? I know some health departments are using that for outbreak investigation, using your frequent purchase uh, transactions to look for if you bought that bag lettuce or whatever that item was, um, to reduce the number of app, like regular uh, phone calls they'd have to do. Um, but that's probably the only, I think it's an area right for um, considering what else could be applied to that. So it has been considered here using flybys databases to see what people have bought, because recall is not so good when we do outbreak investigations. Um, it's, there's obviously commercial barriers. What you probably need is a startup that convinces uh, all these companies that would be great corporate citizens if they collaborate on a method to do this. You probably need encryption, and, but it would be a great thing to do. Any questions? Yeah, good. You, you, you talked about the ethics. You know, I know some of the people I know within HMI always complain that with the technology moving so fast and to keep up to date, every time you want to change the research, they come across the ethics procedures and protocols that have been placed by the institutions and governments. Is there conversation going on to change that? Well, I can let Ciro talk about the research. We've been very careful in the work that we're doing at Global, the press fund, to really help with disease surveillance. So we don't support research per se. So our systems that we're working with are very simple because we're basically just trying to collect symptoms of illness anonymized so that in developing countries where public health systems are so poor, we're at least finding outbreaks or clusters of illness uh, that doesn't exist, you know, right now. So, for example, I think the EpiHack in Myanmar will be a phenomenal opportunity because when I met with the Minister of Health in December, you know, literally they have a complete paper-based system. They have no capacity to really detect an outbreak because by the time any of that data gets aggregated from any health center and makes its way to the clinic or up to the uh, epidemiology center, uh, it's all so old and like retrospectively they could probably go back and find out there were outbreaks. So the hack of on there is really to just take their data, and this is the government owning it, and turning it into an ability to have that all reported in real time every day, which really will open up the opportunities to think about how we're going to find outbreaks. So we've been trying to just, A, you know, work with the government because it's their responsibility to be disease control. They are, these are their citizens and these are their systems. Uh, the only one that we own, per se, is Flu Near You. And again, you know, we don't even go as far as you guys do here in flu tracking of asking people, did they go get a flu test and was it positive or negative or, you know, other questions. We literally just do symptom surveillance because we worry a lot about these unanswered questions about ethics and so forth. So we've strictly stayed within disease surveillance because we think like the letter of the law about what you can do for disease surveillance uh, is very clear. Um, whereas I think it's still uncertain with some of these things that are really combining research with disease surveillance. Uh, and so we're glad to be part of this community and think through some of those challenges, but uh, it's not something that you know we've sort of had to tackle head on. So I know you do a lot more research, so it's probably a bigger issue for you. Yeah, it is, and uh, um, and in a sense, what we uh, what we discovered uh, along the way is that you need to be part of that conversation. You you cannot be a passive subject just uh, applying for an RV, waiting for the outcome, cheering when you clear it. I mean that's all fine, of course, but. Uh, I think it's uh, we, we are really at an inflection point in the technologies, uh, and, and we really need to. And, and people who use intensely data, I think, have a, the, the responsibility to actually be part of that conversation, whether they are training ethics or not. It's important to create events where where you bring together practitioners, researchers, uh, expert in ethics. We have an excellent one in Torino, it's called Nexo Center for Internet and Society, and it's basically uh, a sort of. 
um, uh, informally organized community of lawyers, practitioners, people who do criminal law, criminal uh, digital forensics, um, experts in uh, um, policy, and engineers and researchers. And the conversation are really very interesting because you speak a different language, but after a while you start aligning on some problems and, and, you really, and you really start to see what needs to be done in order to improve things. And the, 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 time, the, the times in terms of evolution of law are of course what they are. Um, but, but I think uh, right now it's our duty as a community to really build awareness and, and to do this actively. By what, what, what's our mission for the future, how this challenges the, the status quo and what we can do to, to actually make things uh, not necessarily more aggressive or more fluid in terms of law actually, but I don't think we need more ideas in terms of what is legal, what is not legal. I think we just need to reframe some core principles that do exist in, uh, in our societies in order to tackle, however, with the challenge of, of the very fast-paced innovation and with new ways of combining uh, individual data points which taken alone are rather harmless but then in combination actually do uh, a lot and can be used to, to nudge behaviors uh, and, uh, and, and to influence outcomes. Um, uh, that I think there needs to be more awareness in general that uh, when, you, when you think about this, this is something that's been going on for a while in, uh, in marketing. You know? People have been doing computational targeting and profiling for a long time. Uh, when we think about behavior change in public health, there is a lot we can learn from that community with the added complexity of, of public health, because you don't want to just sell this. Uh, you want to be aware of the systemic impact of what selling this is, uh, is bringing forth. Um, and, this is, and this is, to me, really the, the, the overarching challenge, trying to, trying to combine the established culture of uh, uh, of human subjects uh, in public health, uh, the, the research ethics, which again has been uh, extensively uh, studied and established in the medical and clinical domains, uh, with, the, with the knowledge and with the challenges um, from software engineering, from social innovation. Um, we, we really need to, to design systems in a different way now, I think, and, uh, and that's why we need to start working on this. Other questions? Yeah. Has, has there any work been conducted anywhere on cross border movements because of the promulgation across countries? Like, like the current thing in South America? Uh, yeah, I'm <clears throat> I guess we support uh, regional disease sur surveillance networks around the world. So, for example, you know, the project that we're doing in Thailand. Uh, with Open Dream is because Thailand is part of a network uh, that involves China, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, um, I I forget Vietnam. Vietnam, thank you. Uh, and so a lot of the projects that we're doing there is about cross-border movement of people and animals uh, for disease surveillance. I'm thinking if you're talking about South America, you're talking about global movement regarding yes. travel. Where, where you fly the systems. Yeah. So we've had some uh, interesting uh, lessons learned from Ebola uh, when our foundation was contacted because of the technology that we'd be doing in other areas by both the US CDC and WHO to think through the issue when they realized healthcare workers were gonna be coming out of the three countries and going to whatever various countries they were going to, uh, as well as other people traveling out of the country for whatever reason. Uh, and we were trying to think through solutions to help them think through how they're going to track all those people when they come back and so forth. While the technology was available and literally was built uh, in about 36 hours uh, by a team of engineers at Salesforce uh, to completely donate a system that could have tracked every nuance that we wanted, um, we were unable to implement that system because there are no agreements legally. Uh, so for example, you come to the United States, into a state, you can only be tracked by that state epidemiologist. Uh, so in other words, 
even though it was a public health emergency of international concern, CDC could not just track people with a single system when they landed in the US because it was the responsibility of that, that person's state. So we had more phone calls with lawyers during that process and were unable to implement technology that was created that could have solved some of these issues which now raises the question that we're trying to struggle with as a foundation, do we need to start getting into advocacy? Like, do we need to start taking on these challenges about you know, federal laws that are needed in the US when there's emergency and international laws that would allow, because our, our solution for WHO was, you, know, you get on an airplane, you watch the, the video about you know, putting on your seatbelt and mask, why are we just adding right on there? You are leaving an Ebola-stricken country. Wherever you land, you are going to be asked to do surveillance, blah, blah, blah. I mean, that would be the easiest way to do it, is enroll people as they're leaving. Because the big challenges were, if you were coming back to the United States, if you had a direct flight, they knew about it. If you flew, well, that's a bad example, but it was Brussels at the time, uh, and you didn't get on a direct flight, they didn't necessarily know when you landed in the United States that you came from Liberia first. So that was our solution, was let's just enroll everybody in the beginning, we can track them, we can give all the data to WHO. Again, got shot down by the lawyers because there's no you know, international agreement that even though when you know, the UN or WHO <coughs> declares a public health emergency of international concern, uh, you're still sort of back to doing public health how we ordinarily do it, and we don't think about what does it mean in that situation and can we start changing some of those laws. So while the technology is easy and we can solve some of those issues, we haven't sort of caught up with the policy to allow that kind of technology to be used. Uh, so we continue to work with the countries to help you know, sort of track movement across borders because that's their responsibility and they're really interested in that. The global efforts, I think, you know, we may have to get into some of that policy issue in order to be more successful with that. Other things about movements, like the EPI hack in, in uh, Albania, um, will probably focus on uh, um, migrants because, uh, and refugees, because they're getting a lot of people from Syria that are coming into that area. And if you think about it, you know, something where a system that's, you know, used on a mobile phone or others could allow you to do uh, tracking and surveillance, uh, even in those, you know, refugee kind of populations. So that's about the extent that we've gotten involved in the foundation, but uh, uh, we'd love to do more. We just realized now we're going to have to tackle some of these, you know, policy changes if we want to really be able to use technology in ways that, you know, it could help solve some of these issues. I'll take one or two more questions before we finish, and then everyone's invited to wine and cheese uh, in the foyer. Continue the conversation there. So, other questions? Good. Um, wearable devices, you know, you mentioned uh, the, the iPhones, there's lots of like Fitbits, and every, there's so many applications on mo uh, mobile devices to monitor your heart and, um, and all those type of things. Are those companies or those um, organizations that are creating that, are they open to act, allowing you to access through APIs that data? No, that's a challenge. The, these are all mini silos, in fact. And they are designed to be sold uh, for reasonable and uh, commercial and uh, understandable reason, reasons. But, um, but to do research on top of those data or to think of help on top of those data is a problem. If you bring your Fitbit record to a doctor, the doctor will not even want to look at it. And same for your uh, heart uh, rate meter, right? So uh, we, we have a double challenge there. The first one is to uh, demonstrate uh, where possible that these signals are actually signals that can be used for, uh, for clinical uh, reasoning uh, and interventions. The second is actually empowering uh, the, the customers with the ownership of the, of the data. That's one way that, that uh, is being allocated so that this data can be actually taken out of the, of the silo and, and shared. Uh, there are a number of uh, problems there, both technical and, uh, and of viability of the products that, that you can uh, uh, So right now what we are seeing is uh, really a proliferation of, uh, of silos, even, uh, even across the same uh, brand, even across the same different devices of the same brand. You know? 
move your data and to tracking with an upgraded device and points. Um, this will have to change somehow. So we need to either have a sort of broker uh, agents uh, that you endow with the ownership of this data. And people are reasoning a lot about uh, something they call personal data stores. Uh, and the idea is again of empowering you as a citizen to own all the data generated by your devices and then to a system of APIs which will have to be standardized, discussed. It's a huge challenge. Uh, you can give permission to an entity uh, to look at specific features on your data. Not, not necessarily in a blanket fashion access your data. Uh, you, you give a software agent the permission to compute something on top of those data and, and transmit the result of that computation, which is hailed as a way to be as privacy preserving as possible while still maintaining many of the benefits of, of data mining at scale, uh, this type of data. Um, there, there is, I mean, so far the situation is like this. I don't know if you, if you, if you want to add something about this. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, some of the positive news out there is that people who are creating wearable devices are actually thinking about using the data for disease surveillance. So while they may not be giving us that, they're actually thinking about doing it themselves. Uh, I think probably the most um, uh, relevant device in that respect is the thermometer. So people are literally trying to create thermometers that connect to your phone so that the moment you take the temperature, and I know you started flu tracking with just fever it's the question you want. And in most places where we work, we would be thrilled to have real-time fever surveillance as a single uh, symptom. So, you know, that movement of either, you know, the thermometer that connects directly to your phone or the digital thermometer that has Wi-Fi capability or Bluetooth capability that sends it up. So, while we would love to get that data, people are realizing because of some of the innovations that are going on, um, that not only is that thermometer now cool because that's their business model and they need to sell something that uh, they also have data that's really valuable that they should be analyzing on their own to look at disease outbreaks or so forth or probably more likely license that data or sell that data so it may cost money but uh, you know it's exciting to see that people are developing the technologies and thinking about other uses of that data other than just the specific thing that that device did alone so I think we'll see a lot of you know interesting conversations out there. I mean, just one example where you know we tried to work with a company in flu near you a couple of years ago, um, Kleenex. I'm sure you all know Kleenex brand uh, tissue. Um, they wanted to start a campaign called Ah Chu, uh, where literally they were going to sort of basically build a flu near you surveillance system. Uh, and try to you know monitor obviously because they want to sell Kleenex and other products uh, you know the first indications of when flu is hitting a community or targeting and so forth and we basically said well that's silly we'll just give you flu near you you can still have your campaign you can call it on to or whatever and all we really wanted to say you know powered by flu near you because our thought was ah you know how corporate uh, programs go they'll do it for a while and and then. You know, if they wanted to do this and we literally could use Flu Near You as their tracking system, then we could keep those people even if, you know, Achu doesn't continue with Kleenex. Again, got tied up with the lawyers. And then you find out, like, wow, companies are really, really close vested with the, any data that they think could be used by anybody else for any proprietary reason. So even though we were going to give them Flu Near You to use as their tracking system, uh, it, it, the company's like, no, we have to build our own. Because they didn't want any sort of process where data that they had would sort of leave their own internal system in any way and go into another system, even though it was a, you know, presented as a, an open two-way communication. So, I don't know. I mean, at least the conversation started, so maybe we'll start seeing later on that people will be more open to, you know, you can use your data for your own proprietary reasons, but all we want you to do is also dump it into our data set to just add more people and more values. And I think maybe we will get there eventually. And, and on another, if I may add on, uh, on a positive note, uh, we, we are starting to see for hardware, for uh, wearable devices in particular, the same way of open source so design uh, that we, we saw for software in the 80s and the 90s, and which is still ongoing and a constant evolution. So hopefully, since a lot of the tech uh, underlying it 
with uh, it's relatively simple since now you can fabricate things very easily and this trend will, will continue. We probably see a wave of open source, open hardware, uh, open source wearable devices, uh, and, and, and probably some of these projects will reach critical mass, which then empowers them uh, to, to behave like an actor in a sense to negotiate uh, agreements. So some of them will be supported by something similar to the Apache Foundation. So probably we'll see some of that uh, open, uh, open source innovation happen also for wearable devices and for wearable devices so for, for health and at least this is what, what we can hope for. Someone has asked a question at the back, had their hand up, I thought. Cool. Yeah. Any questions in the back? No. Yeah. It's Thanks for questions. Last two. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, that's sure. What is the first question for uh, Mark with regards to uh, Google? You work for Google in terms of their Android platform. Are they open to actually allowing that in, in, in your domain? And the second question is this Chiro? 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 I just want to read the socio pattern. What does it mean? No, okay. Good. Uh, so I'm not quite sure what you were asking. Well, in, in terms of, you said one of, one of the problems is, like the Phoenix example, people view data as something they can make money out of rather than actually look towards a common good. Google have actually got. Have, we're working with you're working in Google with the data prevention medicine, prevention healthcare. Would, would they have actually be <coughs> more amenable than Kleenex in terms of using the Android platform to collecting data? Oh well I mean Google's philosophy is basically to create tools that people can use for their own purpose. So Android is a perfect example of you know, there are all, including Fluter U, Dr. Me, all these systems are built on Android. So, you know, um, I think what they wanted to do is they did want to be in a position of continue for people coming to ask them to do something. So the idea is, can you build a, a platform, you know, where people can build their own apps and, and do things uh, without them having to take it on? So I think it, you know, they created a platform that allows us to do these apps and so forth. Um, they have crossed into a territory that we've uh, understood recently because uh, I left there in 2010 that, that helped start up the School Gold Threads Fund. Um, but they are helping NGOs now who want to create an app on the Android platform that's for a complete social good that they will actually <coughs> use their engineers at Google to help those organizations build the best Android app that they can. I think that's a nice service. Um, so that's, that's about the only thing I think I could add to that. Not mm -hmm. used to work for Google or yeah, Google not Google. Google. com, so it's the philanthropic. Yeah. Um, and Sociopathians is just the name of the project. It's just a uh, <laughs> collaboration uh, where we where we are measuring social mixing patterns. Um, the, the way you mean this in uh, in epidemiology. So we, we want to see what are the the interactions in terms of close range proximity um, of individuals in schools, uh, hospitals, in the general community uh, to inform with these data mathematical models. So that's just the name of the, our code name for the project. Can you explain this uh, visualization? Oh, you, uh, yeah. Um, well, well, this was fun. This was um, uh, at the Science Gallery in uh, Dublin. Uh, this was an exhibition organized, uh, it was called Infectious, and it was an exhibition about infectious diseases. So what they asked us to do was to uh, create, uh, on top of our uh, uh, sensing platform, a, a virtual epidemic which would unfold in the community of visitors of the museum. So an infected device would blink very visibly, and if you would spend uh, uh, too much time in seeing the infected <laughs> individual, you would also get infected. Uh, so what you see there is uh, uh, one, of these, uh, one of these contact networks, uh, what, uh, Imagine a hand of a clock coming from about 1 p.m. when the exhibition opened all the way to, uh, to 5 p.m., I guess that is. Uh, and and the, the color codes the time at which uh, the individual entered the museum. Every dot there, every circle is an individual. It's colored according to the time when that individual entered the, the exhibition. And then two dots are connected by a link. Uh, if those two guys spent at least, in this case, I think a couple of minutes in close range proximity. Uh, of each other. So what you see here is that in this case you have a flow of people streaming through the venue, and so the, the, the contact network that emerges uh, is sort of 
prescribed by sort of a non-Yetic structure because of course people who enter early never met the guys who enter much later during the day. Uh, but but it is nevertheless it's connected. So actually a pathogen potentially can jump from person to person and persist in uh, in this uh, in this community. So this is the exercise we are, we are playing there. And it turned out real fun because some kids learned that they would infect random individuals, so they would just run and hug them <laughs> and infect them. Other people were being chased, uh, and uh, at some point we discovered that a lot of the kids would get uh, uh, would really freak out with this idea of the infected devices, and so we we created a, a doctor in a corner, which was another device that would reset you to the non-infected <laughs> And so there was a queue of kids queuing uh, to get fixed by the, the doctor and then going back and of course fighting with the with the, with the other guys who were seeing the infections. So it was really fun. Then after uh, ten days, this was running. The H1N1 pandemic uh, broke out. And, uh, and so we, we, the, the number of visitors at this exhibition skyrocketed. We, we had uh, almost 40,000 people visit this over the course of uh, uh, a couple of months. Uh, and each point, each diagram you see on the right hand side is the snapshot of the contact network for that day. Uh, and then you can see that in days of low flux, uh, the network is disconnected. In days of very high flux, the weekends, actually you get the fully connected network structure. Uh, we got a really nice data set, and um, um, I think there are like six, seven publications out of this, uh, and the data open. You can go to our website and download the data. Uh, part of the agreement with, uh, with the museum uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and the consent that was implied in uh, attending the exhibition implied that we could uh, um, share this data in, of course, without linking it to any, anything personal. Um, so yeah, yeah that's, that's the story. Thanks. Okay, well look, thank you so much. Uh, in closing, and before we go out to have some more face-to-face -face interaction, we can ask some more questions. Uh, one and two, so I want to thank uh, Skull Global Threats for uh, supporting the IWOPS conference, uh, bringing everybody over. Thank you for all the IWOPS attendees, it's been wonderful. Thank you to HMRI for supporting IWOPS and took you to Janine, who's done so much. The food packing team, who did so much to help as well. And uh, first, thank you, and let's thank the speakers. Thank you.